right now, um, I'm here with James Robertson, and uh, I'm super excited to get into this conversation because James is running for the, and at any point throughout this, James, correct me, because I'm a novice when it comes sure, to politics, sure. and this is going to be a huge learning um, experience yeah. for me, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm hoping for the audience, too. I hope to learn um, some stuff from you as well. So awesome, man. We'll, we'll go for it. Awesome. Let's do it. Awesome. So uh, so you're running for the uh, federal conservative running. Am I am I labeling that correctly? Kind of, uh, or close to it. So you're 80% okay. there. So okay. um, there's a new federal writing. Uh, the old federal writing used to be called St. John Rossi, which the current MP is Wayne Long. Yes. Uh, liberal MP. He'll be, uh, I think he's made indications that he's he's done after this term. This is kind of, this is it for him. Uh, at the same time, <clears throat> I think in a couple of weeks, there'll be an announcement of the riding boundaries changing. So it'll be, uh, I believe it's going to be called St. John Kennebecasis riding. So oh, SJKV. Interesting. And so you're going to lose uh, the the west side of St. John, so everything across on the Harbor Bridge, that won't be a part of the riding. The riding will now consist of like St. John, Rosse, Quiz Pam. East St. John, Rosse, Quiz Pam. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And, and where I am running, or what I am doing right now is I am, I've put my name forward yes. within a nomination uh, uh, race to become the candidate for the Conservative Party to go against whoever is going to replace. Wayne Long and whoever's going to be Green and NDP come a federal election. Federal election will likely not occur until I believe it's October of next year. So right now right, my battle yeah. is to win the conservative nomination to become the candidate for the conservative party in this area. Right. And then that election, that happens at the same time that the Trudeau election is happening? Or what, no? The, nom the nomination? Yeah. Well, the nomination will happen whenever the writing association decides. Um, and... So it that could happen could, at any time. It could happen within a couple months. It could happen later in the summer, in the fall. Who knows? Okay. So I, do, I have no control over that. The only control I have over it is getting my name forward, yep. reaching out to people, putting out the material and social media, letting people get a chance to get to know me. Yep. And that's where I'm at right Which now. Which you seem to be doing very early. <sighs> Maybe, maybe. Is there not. anyone else? Like, do you know who I've heard maybe there's one or two against? people is sniffing there? around, but yeah. until that that's very common in nominations. Is yeah. I think some people want it easy. So they're kind of sniffing around and if no one's putting their name forward or whatnot, they'll jump on it. If there's someone out there battling out, getting, you know, doing all the calls, doing all the hard work, a lot of times they'll be like, eh, not gonna bother. Right. No, I'm not in it. Because it, it is an incredible amount of work. Absolutely. It's a lot of humble pie reaching out to people. Uh you know, and, and seeing if they're willing to support you. One, if they're willing to support the Conservative Party, and two, if they're willing to support you if they are uh, a member or want to become a member of the Conservative Party. Right, and then all of that is done after, because most people doing this would have a job as well. So yes. this is all done after hours on your own time. Yes. So yes. there's no guarantees with what's going to come of it, and it's a major feat to take on, I'm sure, yeah. and something that would be some... Um, that would consume a lot of time. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's. So it's, you have to want it for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to be ready to fight. You got to be ready to put in the long, uh, long hours and work. Yeah. But that's, I think that's a really important aspect because mm -hmm. that's what people should expect of their politicians, right? 100%. You're a public servant. It's not about you. It's not about your ego. You're there to serve the community. So you better be ready to put in the work, uh, wear out some pairs of shoes, knocking on doors, Getting the hand sore from, you know, shaking all the hands and listening to people's stories. But that's where it comes from. That's what Absolutely. you have to do. Absolutely. I love it. It's a little bit similar in real estate, a little bit, where yeah. if you do want to stand out from the competition, you need to do similar stuff, right? Yeah. You yeah. need to get out there, do some door knocking, be out having conversations. You can't just sit back and expect business to come to you. So it's it's actually mm -hmm. similar. So um, I really, so I really respect that. I really respect that. Now, in saying the hard work... I want to talk a little bit about your background because okay. I know you have a a military background, James. Yeah, uh, and so <laughs> from what I believe, it's Navy, right? Uh, Navy and Special Forces. Navy and Special Forces. Yeah. yeah. So can you talk a little bit about yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my background. So one of my primary identifiers is a military veteran. 
uh, <clears throat> got out around, I think, four or five years ago. Time's going fast. Of so, course. Yeah, uh, the last few years, yeah, especially. Yeah, exactly. Right. It seems like everything through COVID, it just went like into hyperspeed. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm 15 year uh, military veteran, served both uh, as a naval officer and a special forces officer. So um, was hardcore about it, too. Mm -hmm. uh, big time, high operational tempo. I loved and lived the uh, Navy diving, uh, navigating ships, driving ships. That was all my business. I loved it. Uh, through two tries, uh, on my second try, I made it, became a special forces assault officer for Joint Task Force 2. Uh, did that for a number of years, served in Afghanistan. And then uh, upon completion of that, coming back, went back to the Navy for a couple years uh, in terms of family, supporting family and stuff. And decided it was time for a new life. So transitioned out, got my MBA, uh, went into consulting initially, uh, companies like Pricewater, uh, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, which gave me a really good exposure to industry. So healthcare, capital projects, ship, shipbuilding, yeah, uh, utilities, you name it. Uh, then uh, went into healthcare in terms of helping uh, develop leaders within healthcare from frontline leaders all the way up to uh, executives. Okay. And then decided I wanted to get back in operations. So I went into the career that I am in now. So that is uh, within the port operations. So I okay. uh, took a job with DP World uh, as a superintendent, moving containers. So working on on offloading, onloading uh, container ships, rail, truck, okay. whatnot. And then uh, there was this unique opportunity that came up a couple of years ago um, to come out to St. John. So DP World had come out here, was doing major expansion within the uh, port and kind of came up. Was anyone interested in this? Looked at that. My wife is uh, from Italy, all her family's in Italy. So it was got us closer to that. And we were just ready for a change. I originally had grown up in a small town, so came out here, fell in love with the city very quickly, uh, moved out here with my family, and uh, yeah, we moved out into the valley uh, just near the Qplex. We love yeah. it, and that's where I'm at now. It's incredible out here. Yeah. So, yeah. so before you came came to St. John, had you been had you been out east here before, or did you just do some research and then take, oh, the, been, yeah, take the jump? Yeah, I've been through New Brunswick a number of times uh, as a Navy guy. Uh, especially as an officer, you're going to spend a fair bit of time in Halifax off and on. Right, so, right, right. That makes sense. So, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I uh, had a number, a couple of stints within uh, Halifax. Uh, so yeah, I, I was quite familiar with the uh, Maritimes, uh, had been uh, to, to everywhere uh, uh, out here. And a lot of my, my co-workers and shipmates and whatnot came came from the Maritimes. So you, so you get it. And I think... Back when I was a very young subby, um, I made the mistake at one point of saying, "Oh, the yeah, the the, the ships were made in in St. John's," and uh, right. one of the uh, shipmates lost it on me in a kind of a good way, of saying, "No, it was St. John, and yeah. that's the real St. John." And I was like, "Oh, yeah. whoa, 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 what's going on here?" Yeah, so, down at the dry dock, you mean? Yeah, yeah at the dry yeah. dock, so, right? Yeah, that was yeah. a booming that was a booming time for St. John, from yeah. what I've heard. I've heard yeah. a lot of. Uh, the 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 old fellas that I talked to that St John was booming during that time yep. and uh, there was almost a lost opportunity unfortunately know, where things got moved to Halifax yeah. and we see how that's affected Halifax yeah. they are yeah. they're almost a little bit of the Vancouver of the East but I think St John's starting to turn around in that direction yep. too like with the container with the um, cranes that they just had brought in and yep. we're seeing a massive amount of expansion here in St John yep. we're seeing the most that I've ever seen in my life there's always been promises of things happening there's been all these plans of developments going on for years and yep. years and years and it'll hit the paper but nothing ever happened we're finally starting to see yep. things move forward a little bit so that's interesting and then also well I think you know what's you know what else is interesting though tell me so <laughs> for the audience <laughs> as, as we're looking towards st john uh we're looking on you know what else is interesting we're, we're looking at some youtube influencers here to give us inform information and there was a, a, a tribe called owens that was one he Love would him. do jordan yeah there yep. was um a a couple 
Uh, I think they're in the real estate now. They did some videos. The drive-by community tours. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. You know what? I've never met them yet. I've never met them. And I and I really wonder I, if they're still doing it. And yeah. And then yep. there was this this guy that was a hurricane of energy. Uh, you. <laughs> that was he. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, man. Thank you. And I, yeah, so I, when I first, I think I, I saw you at the gym the one time, and I'm like, you're the guy. You're that guy. <laughs> you're yeah, that guy. Yeah, you played a role in us getting out here. So. And it's crazy. I've heard it from a handful of people and um i never expected any of it i just i see youtube as an untapped potential yep. for delivering value to people because there's nobody really doing youtube right in in this area in my opinion okay. and if there is there's there's it's it's one or two like you said a tribe called uh called owens which i've linked up with jordan many times i have okay. conversations with him he is such an authentic and amazing human being and he comes across that way on the camera and that's very just zen. very <laughs> zen <laughs> and it's like you always wonder is that person the same off camera mm -hmm. too right mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. talk to him and he is and is it's uh and just seeing like how much of a family person he is i love I just love the opportunities that YouTube's created. Yeah. I mean, speaking of that, James, I just closed two deals this month from YouTube alone. Really? <laughs> yeah. So one was from um, this lady in California. She's a Canadian citizen. California. So she's in California right now, and she wanted to buy a property here on the water that she could come and visit, but then also rent out when she's not here. Oh, okay. So she's a Canadian citizen, though. She's Did got she her originally citizen come from this area? No. <laughs> How? I don't know. Everybody seen New Brunswick as like this, as this haven to come and buy real estate. And a big reason is, is because when you look at the province or at the um, country and each province, like average home price of each province, yeah. New Brunswick has one of the lowest average home prices. So I think people are looking at it as a great investment opportunity. It's but I think we've, out here as we've well. also been put yeah. on the map in the last few years yeah. as a province that's actually enjoyable. And you can come here and enjoy the, the scenery, the, all the nature, the lifestyle, the slower pace, slower pace, the slower pace, pace, which yeah. I think a lot of people have been craving the last few years, especially. And um, it just seems like we were put on the map all of a sudden because the population of New Brunswick was declining for the longest time or just pretty well stagnant. And we've now been going through an immense amount of growth. Actually, we just, I think Higgs was just announcing that we hit 850,000 yep. people here. Yeah. And uh, I just, I just did a video on that actually talking about okay. the population growth okay. and, um, and kind of how how that's contributed to some of the rising house prices. And I know there's there's a lot of speculation actually on that topic <laughs> of people coming here and bringing up house prices, but it's going to happen regardless. It's like Vancouver yeah. in the 80s. You know, the average house price in Vancouver in the 80s was about like 250,000, 300,000. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it now, it's close to a million dollars. Right. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, places. It's even more than that for a lot of it. It's. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, yeah, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, uh, it, you know, Calgary's now going through like Calgary's parabolic, but, the, mm -hmm. you know, bustling economy there. Um, you have like high immigration numbers coming in, low supply. Yeah. Um, that's a that's one of our big issues. It's just it's just not enough supply, right? So, yeah. um, with a high demand, low supply, what's going to happen? The price, price goes up. Gonna, price goes up. I know. So, and yep. you have, I think, in uh, like New Brunswick, Maritimes, is a lot of people. I think one. I think some of them are just looking to get off the treadmill. They just like yep. the busyness of life. They're, they're tired of the you know one to two hour commute, uh, taking out of their day. That and would take a toll on you. <laughs> like I just sat in some traffic yesterday for the West side bridge <laughs> and it was like for literally maybe seven minutes. And I, and I called my girlfriend and I said, I couldn't imagine having to deal with this for an hour each day. Yeah. That would be so depressing. Yeah. Uh, and and I've actually gone through it living in Calgary for a little while. I was in Calgary just yeah. for about six months and it would take about 30 minutes to drive maybe seven kilometers. Yeah. After so, after working, so it's like just slow down here a bit, right? Things and, do, and, uh, and, and and like we take it for granted here. But uh, yeah, it's, I think people do, um, but they, they, and I think there's just an authenticity to people here. Uh, what shocked I think my parents a bit, you know, I'm not a huge person on Facebook. You know, politics has got me back into having to put stuff out there, but my wife's quite active there yeah. in terms of. Uh, maintaining that familiarity relation with all her family in, in Italy. But, you know, it, it's also great for, for my parents, right? They're looking in and they're quite shocked at how quickly we integrated into the community and how we're involved in a bunch of things so fast. Well, that, that's, I mean, you know, my wife and I, we put ourselves out there, Yep. but that's also just the community. Like it's, it's 
it's just the people here, right? They're yeah. very accepting, you know, moved in my house and right away I had neighbors coming over, right? And yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, remarkable. Even the school, like, you know, kids came here and the school right away was like having a welcome party and we were getting invited to birthdays and everything. It's phenomenal, so. Yeah, and, uh, and that is part of the lifestyle here is the community where you're living in, when you're living in big cities, you don't get as much of that. And that was one reason that I actually left Calgary when I was living there is because I'm a very social individual and I like to just go out and about and just talk to people. If I'm on a, <laughs> if I'm on a bus with a whole bunch of people and I'm sitting beside somebody and yeah. like, they're not like directly like doing something like I'll spark up a conversation like, yeah. Hey, how's it going? Like yeah. we're both going to the same spot here, but most people don't like that in big cities. They think you're trying to sell them something. They think you're trying to scam them. Yeah. They think you're trying to, they think you're a serial killer. Like it's like <laughs> they get like legit nervous. And like, if you hold the door open for somebody there, they like give you a dirty look. And I'm like, this isn't right. This isn't a good way to live. And I think the reason is, is because there's so many people that even if you take the same train or the same bus every single day, you're rarely going to see the same person twice because yeah. there's so many people. So yeah. So they just, everybody's a commodity. Yeah. Everybody's just, don't talk to me. I'll never see you again. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They're treating each other <laughs> poorly. And it's just not a good way to live, in my opinion. I, I, but, I do have one warning, though, to people from the outside uh, looking in that want to come here, is the checkout lines here can take a lot of time. And the reason <laughs> is, is because the people end up talking so long to the cashier at the checkout right, line, right. right? Because they know one another, you know, they want to know how so-and-so is doing. How are the kids? It, it, how are the kids? It's, uh, I mean, sometimes I kind of got to grit my teeth, you know, because I really want to get that item. I need to get out, yeah. go, go do my another uh, errand. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, that's, <laughs> but it's also a testament to the, to uh, the friendliness uh, of the people here and of this province and town. Well, I'm very glad you're enjoying it, James. I'm yeah, very glad yeah. you're enjoying it. And I and I love what you're doing with the community too, because you're coming in from a very strong background and looking to make changes. So I think that would be a great pivot point to kind of get okay. into is um, why, let's, let's talk about why you got into politics. What makes somebody get into wanting to run, um, for the conservative party? What, um, like what inspired you? What motivated you? What did you see that needed to change? Mm. You said, I'm going to, I'm going to get involved in okay. this. Okay. Well, I think the first, uh, element, maybe not just even the conservative, but the first element in terms of getting involved in politics is, yeah, I think one is, uh, people either want to make a change, um, they have some family-based background uh, to it. You know, they they saw their parents do it or whatnot. There was a sense of familiarity that got into it. Um, or, you know, they get asked from people, hey, like, you know, you should consider it, put your name in, get involved and all that. But it, it is, I think, about serving the community, yeah. uh, helping support change. Um, uh, I mean, there can be some cynical views of why people get involved, but uh, to me, right. honestly, like uh, the vitriol that you'll face, uh, the work, the travel, um, yeah, the the benefits, like no, like and there's and there's times too when I've like put my name forward and you're just like, oh, got to take that deep breath, you know? Okay, here we go, you know? Like before you post that video and you're just waiting for the haters to come at you and all that. Like, and there's always going to be that. There's yeah. always going to be that now. I know what you're saying about the cynical views of people getting into politics because it's like people have a bad um, insinuation with politicians <laughs> thinking like, oh, this is just a power hungry person. Yeah. But I think right off the bat with your history of yeah. a military background, yeah. it's almost like that's who you'd want to be in a leadership position for a country. You'd want somebody with a very strong background in mm -hmm. leadership mm -hmm. in, in real difficult situations. Like you said, special forces, like that is no easy feat for anybody that heard that of you doing special forces. I was in the military as well, just as a reservist. I never did any time overseas, mm -hmm. but, uh, you did. And I respect that tremendously. But then the special forces aspect is a whole other level. That's a whole other, yeah. um, testament to who you are as a person. Thank you. Because that is no easy feat. And when I say <laughs> that, I can't even put it into words properly on how difficult that is because it's such a small percentage even of the military. Like everybody, there's so many soldiers that are like, I want to be special forces, but it's not for everybody. <laughs> and it's for a very small percentage of the best of the best. So then coming from that aspect of you wanting to come in and make a change, it's like, 
that is a big reason why I wanted to bring you on because okay. it's like I I and I this is our second conversation we've had. Yeah. But just based on the first conversation, I feel like I can normally get a pretty good read from somebody, and it's like. I like where you're coming from and I like what okay. you're trying to do here. So that's a, why I wanted to bring you on. And uh, I just wanted to kind of give that, that Testament. And I know where you're coming from on that, on that cynical portion. And I don't think that's your intention at all, but there's definitely a lot of that in politics. Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, my, my dad will give it to me right off the bat, you know, uh, and don't take this as like, you know, dad frowning or looking down on, on what I'm doing, but you know, he'll, he'll kind of joke, you know, when I said, Oh dad, this is what I'm going to do. And he's like, "Mm -hmm." he's like, uh, he's like, James, do you know uh, how you can tell a politician's lying? (laughs) I'm like, uh, no dad. And he's like, their mouth is moving. I'm like, "Ah, like, ah, 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 ah." so it's, uh, uh, yeah. And, and I guess for me, uh, a couple driving things, uh, for me is, is one, I do think there's a little bit of like a feeling a sense from people of like, am I taking a crazy pill here? Like government continues to make my life more and more inspect, uh, you know, uh, in- expensive. Like, right. it, it, like, like what is going on here? It was like the 23% increase on the carbon tax. Like life was already unaffordable, you know, seven out of 10 Canadians don't want this thing. All the, you know, generally most of the premiers in this country are like, like enough, stop. And the Trudeau government continues to go forward with it, right? It's um, it's generally the demonization of the resource sector, something that historically has been a a key part of the Canadian economy. Still is like the Canadian economy is largely being held up and driven by our energy sector, right? Within the the uh, prairie provinces, so it's there's that, there's that the the economic things and and the this word economy. What not? What not? Is is been demonized? I think by many of of the the center center left in this country um, to be this heartless, soulless thing. It is not. When we speak about the economy, we speak about people's livelihoods. Right. It's yeah. about people making uh, good money um, to be able to afford to live here. Uh, regardless of all the flaws or whatnot that people want to point out, this is still probably one of the greatest countries in the world. At least I believe so. Yep. Uh, it's still one of the most attractive places for people to come to move to. Work to yeah. And, uh, you know, have despite a family. Despite what Trudeau's <laughs> turned it into. <laughs> despite, yes, despite <laughs> that. And There's uh, a little bit uh, of course maybe, correcting. I'll, I'll use this word, uh, the, the Laurentian elite, which is kind of your... Um, I think your your Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal bubble, yeah. uh, and they all seem to um, kind of talk the same language, speak the same things. Um, so I'll I'll use that term a bit here. Uh, I'm not anti elite. I'm just generally pointing out against an elite that seems to hold our country in some form of disdain, or at least it holds mm. in dis- dis- disdain when it's popular to do so or it gives them points politically, and that drives me nuts. Right. Uh, I'm fine with an elite that is patriotic uh, and believes in its country and believes in bettering its country. So there's that. Um, I'm also very big, so a huge part of the federal at the federal level, federal government is international matters. So that's your national security, defense, international trade. That's a big part of me. That's a that's a big identifier in me. So uh, you know that started at an early age, being very interested in military history, international security, up through university, uh, d- developed a. a, a, a a keen interest in Asia Pacific matters, which we'll uh, we'll speak on a, a little bit further. In keen here. interest in what? Asia Pacific. So Asia, Asia Pacific. Asia, okay. Asia Pacific. So uh, that is. So when I went to uh, school, uh, that was becoming um, a bigger and bigger concern uh, through the rise of China. Right. And it's a very big concern and a very big issue for Canadians. And I think a lot of Canadians aren't quite sure what to make of it. Um, but I assure you, it is a very important matter. Mm-hmm. And then in this time, in this place, uh, let's just put it out there uh, of why this this thing is going to be so important. We yep. are now in a new Cold War. Right. We're in a Cold War. Um, a lot of people don't want to believe it or they're not ready to believe it, but we are in a Cold War. A peace with no peace. But it will be deadlier likely deadlier than the first one. And it might not, we always like to try to put our historical lens on a current system. 
some of that will apply, but I suspect based on, you know, my studies and, and, you know, what I've read and listened to, this one could be uh, shorter. It may not drag on as long. It might come to a hot war very quickly. Now, why that is a concern is because at the same time, can I stop that, you there for a second? Yeah, who, go ahead. Who are we in a cold war with? <laughs> who do you think we're in a cold war with? Well, let me ask. Yeah, so I guess at this point, um, the Cold War of so what it seems like would be is it is it BRICS, Russia and China? Yeah. So Russia, China, which uh, there's one person that calls it the Dragon Bear Alliance. Um, you can see it. They calls it what? The Dragon Bear Alliance. The Dragon Bear Alliance. Alliance okay. Right? Okay. That's, um, yeah, that's Russia yeah, and China. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So primarily led by uh, the the Chinese under the Xi Jinping regime. regime. Um, but you have <laughs> under that, and you can see it um, working together right now. You've got... Uh, and it's being played out in, in you, the, the war zones of, of Ukraine, right. is you have uh, China, Russia, Iran. So Iran's making a bunch of moves in the Middle East. And go into that uh, whole spiel as well in terms of Hamas, Hezbollah, Israel, basically wars uh, or, or uh, military action taken against uh, Israel through Iranian proxies. Um, and then, you know, you still have uh, the crazy one, which is North Korea. Uh, right. You know, a little bit of a loon of a, of a country, but it's still there. Right. Um, but yes, this is primarily China, right? China, through its ascendancy, um, you know, its growth and technological prowess, economic power, um, whatnot, has become just naturally uh, one of the main rivals right. to, to, I guess, kind of the Western... Uh, uh, world order, mm -hmm. primarily led by the U.S. We're a part of that Western group, right? So, uh, and Canada uh, has been probably, I'd say, deeply affected um, through China's ascendancy. And you, we're seeing that right now through the Hogue Commission, right, which was the political interference in the last two federal elections um, that were determined uh, through the Chinese, right, through the United uh, Workers Front and uh, Wolf Warrior Diplomacy. So, right. so okay. it's coming out now, and uh, it's one of my things which I get pretty passionate I get about. Passionate about, somewhat upset is uh, the lackadaisical attitude of the Trudeau government uh, towards the Chinese threat. I mean, Trudeau is basically not basically he has in the past uh, shown affection towards Xi, mm. said he admires their form of, of government, uh, whether that's some form of slip of the tongue. He has said that. He has said yeah, that before. Yeah. It's a really weird it's clip a really, it's where a, he said he, yeah, he likes the dictatorship and how fast they can turn the country on a dime yeah. because of the control that they have. Yeah. And, so and then he uses the that. admiration for dictatorship it, it is. is very strange. Well, and it's almost becoming evident in a way. Yeah. And I mean, you can look at like, uh, I think you have Sam Cooper, uh, whose uh, book, I believe it is Willful Blindness, uh, and I'm sorry, Sam, it, Mr. Cooper, if I've uh, accidentally <laughs> mislabeled your book. I did read it. Um, that was a really good one. Uh, I find uh, one writer that's excellent is Terry Glavin. Okay. He uh, has his own sub stack. He writes occasionally for the National Post. Uh, him, uh, along with uh, like Sam, they've been well ahead of many Canadians in terms of identifying uh, these issues, right? And, and the 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 infiltration the pressure the the the, the just will again the willful blindness or ignorance of Canadians towards the the Chinese threat and concerns towards our dem democratic institutions now is and this, national security so is this similar as you say the Chinese threat I think about Ray Dalio's video that he made mm. have you watched that specific no. video it's about a forty five minute video talking Tell about me so it talks about how um, during during World War II, that's when the U.S. became, um, started to have its place as a superpower in the yep. world. And then pretty well how the world's gone through many different um, currencies. Right now, we're operating off the off the U.S. dollar, right? Yeah. 
and how before it was the British pound. And then before that, I think it was something with the Dutch, right? Okay. Yep. And how when you have a superpower that rises and that has so much influence within the world, they they go through this big, huge economic growth period. But then there's always a downfall as well. And each each um each country seems to be operating almost on a hundred year cycle. Yes. Almost on a hundred year cycle. Mm -hmm. And because you go through this major growth and then you have that that portion of where you're flourishing, but then things start to get a little bit like almost what we're seeing now where we're not even like making as many goods anymore. Everybody's trying to be a TikTok or everybody's on, <laughs> on camera and it's like there's less real services happening out there and everybody's just trying to make money through entertainment and it's like that's not sustainable for a country's, for a country's model, right? Yeah. And then now with the amount of money that's just being printed freely mm. because we went off of the... We were on the gold standard, well, I guess not us, but the U.S. was on the gold standard for the longest yeah. time. So money had a real association to something of value that you could trade it in for. You could mm -hmm. trade it in uh, technically for Nixon, gold, right? Off. And then Nixon yeah. switched it off the gold standard. Yeah. And now we've just been free printing money. So it's almost like this monopoly system where we keep saving ourselves from debt crises by printing more money, money, which yeah. is actually, and then that's kind of like... Uh, incorporated a lot of the inflation that we're having now too oh, yes, because like time. you said at the oops sorry at the start um the supply and demand the more money you have then it's 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 actually worth less because you keep printing more yeah. so then that's almost a type of tax that's put on to everybody else is this yeah. inflation so as all this is going on i think that the country is kind of in a point of like Things need to be corrected. We're at a we're at a critical point. It seems like where things action needs to be taken before we start to go down a slippery slope of losing control and losing our influence. And mm. and um, I just don't know what the answer is, though. Well, there's a couple things. So one, uh, and I, I I feel, and this is a, under Pierre Polyev, which I find uh, his stance and general leadership of the Conservative Party fairly attractive. One, because I've said it uh, a number of times to people, is I'll use this phrase, he's got shoulders. And what yes. I mean by he's got shoulders, uh, the absolute vitriol and hate uh, that he faces online, he's able to face it. And I've seen hmm. far too many uh, Conservatives in the past um, kind of soft pedal issues, back away, uh, flip flop on things. He hasn't. He's, he's, he's and he, and he's, his intuition has generally been right. So yeah. uh, he was well ahead of, of others in terms of the, the wanton uh, uh, printing of money, the low interest rates, how it was going to come bite us uh, in the butt. And everything he said has turned out to be correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate that. Um, and that's one thing that's why uh, one of the reasons I put my name for it is like, yes, I'm willing to go fight this battle uh, under a guy like that. Because right. he's, you know what, he's going to stand for Canadians. He's going to take it and he's going to push back. And it, it's not pushing back in a negative way. It's just there's an element of integrity of standing up for your values. And, yeah. and, wishing, and I, like I've just seen again, far too many people kind of wishy wash it way through. And I think that's a lot of Canadians are also attracted to that with uh, Polyev, right? It's like, yeah. okay, the man stands for something. Yes. Appreciate it, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I think, um, I think, like you're saying, so Polyev, he has the, the characteristics of a good leader, of a smart, intelligent, intellectual leader who, who seems like he has the interests of Canada in mind, where currently right now, Justin Trudeau doesn't seem to actually care <laughs> about people. It's, I mean, like, like obviously... Ah. He seems to you seem be passionate more passionate on the issue. <laughs> he he seems to be more interested in going on trips and finding ways to fund his organizations um, silently. And there's been so many scandals that he's been involved he's in. Scandals, yeah. And I think what happens is when you have somebody who's the leader of a country that doesn't have good values, it starts to deteriorate from the top because it's a top-down mentality. It's like in the military. If 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 you're if if your uh, unit's being run by somebody who's not a great leader, that's going to affect everybody within the unit because it's going to it's going to 
it's gonna allow them to have a little bit more leniency where maybe they should be a little bit more in line. I think mm -hmm. having good leadership in a country is so important, is so important. And you start to see what happens when you don't have good leadership. And it's uh, it's just been a shame, I think, to see where Canada has going because I think there's less, there's so many Canadians that are unhappy with the current state of the country. I believe that there's more that are unhappy than, um, and maybe this has been always the case, but right now it seems to be worse than it has been in any time in the past that I can remember. Yeah, that's, uh, I'd say that. I'd, I've seen a couple of, uh, of old, uh, uh, political combatants and pundits uh, basically uh, say some of the sentiments you have. They've never seen Canada in this state and they're, I mean, these are people that are 70, 80 years old. That's, right. that's, that's saying something. That is I saying I something. I think one of them, so here's, here's the tough thing um, about this country. And I think one of those kind of qualities you need to look for in a prime minister. And I've seen this element within Polyev. I have not seen this within Trudeau. So, I do believe Trudeau has a certain value set. There's something, uh, something deeply ideological uh, with his group, uh, and I suspect that's Trudeau is a part of that, or either he just repeats what some of his cabinet ministers say, like Stephen Gilbo. But I do think they're ideologues on a very extreme environmental front uh, and some pretty left-wing aspects here. There is almost an anointed... Uh, class element uh, to them where there are betters. We should listen to them. They've got the plans. They know how to do it. And um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I could yeah. go into far more uh, negative uh, elements of that. But the thing is, is what I've seen from Trudeau uh, and what drives me nuts is this, and I'm going to use a strong word, it's a repugnant style of leadership uh, from him and his, the prime minister's office, uh, and some of his key staff, uh, is they play Canadians against one another. Very, right. they're very good at it. They love to play wedge politics. Very divisive. I saw some of that uh, through COVID uh, and demonizing Canadians, which yeah. drove me nuts. Whether I don't care where you stand on the elements of vaccine, I don't want to go down that that road, but. To demonize Canadians is at the prime minister level, is as far as I'm concerned, is completely indefensible. The man should resign. He should resign also for his uh, issues in regards to China. There's so many issues that so many Trudeau issues. should have resigned on. Yeah. Prime Minister of Canada, there's a couple of things. Good government at the federal level is boring. You know a good government is effective. If it's boring, right? right? right I remember right. having That's this one point. time, uh, funny enough, I was in Afghanistan with one of my troops and there was an election occurring and the, the turnout was pretty low. I remember, and I was getting a little upset. I was like, oh, 60, it was like 63, 64%. And I was like, ah, oh, you know, more people should be like involved, putting their vote in, getting involved. And one of my troops said, you know, like, I actually think that's a sign of a healthy democracy. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, because people are bored. Things are just kind of like, it's just, it's just running. They're happy with it. It's going like so a lot. You know, the high voter turnout is not going to necessarily happen when people are satisfied. Right. Things are generally going okay, right? Things are going uh, good. I don't need to get yeah. involved. The Prime Minister of Canada, um, because of all the different voices in this country, and there's many different voices within our federation, it's not about the right choice or the perfect choice. It's about consensus building. And so at the end of the day, we all get a, a piece. We all get some say in it. We may not exactly get what we want, but we get somewhere. And we maintain cohesion of the Federation. Trudeau, I think, has completely failed on mm -hmm. that part. And I think from what I've seen uh, with Polyev already in terms of talking and working with some of the premiers, even though he's the leader of the opposition. And, and here's the other thing that a number of people get really annoyed about is, is uh, well, you know, Polyev's always up against 
everything. You know, it's like, a, he, you know, he's always saying something against what Trudeau wants. Well, that's because that's his job within the Westminster system. His job is to oppose. Mm -hmm. He's to act as a force against um, the, the majority party. Unfortunately, it's a minority. It was elected as a minority, but it uh, became a coalition with uh, NDP's Jagmeet Singh. So they act as a majority, even though they never got that mandate from Canadians. But he is to oppose that, to maintain friction. So it pushes the majority, the party, party that's governing, to better their ideas going forward. So Polyev is doing his job, and he's right. doing it very, very well as an opposition leader, exceptionally well, right? Where uh, through gaining consensus and popularity in the polls by opposing these ideas from Trudeau, bad ideas, they've had to change them a little bit. But Pierre Polyev will be our next prime minister. Yeah, I agree. And one of his biggest <laughs> jobs going forward will be to heal the Federation. It's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. Very divisive right now uh, across uh, the country. A lot of premiers are upset. Um, a lot of them are trying to go on their own track. And some. so it will be to bring it back, to unify right. our country, make it strong. It will be to get our economy back in, in uh, in gear, we've been stagnant, at best stagnant, over the last 10 years. Uh, I think one of the pundits called it a lost decade uh, yeah. for our economy. We have, we have dropped quite a bit uh, within uh, uh, our global ranking of economic output. And um, it will be to get our military back in order and back in order <laughs> very, very quickly. Like, I cannot stress that enough with uh, Canadians is we are in the precipice here. Our military, uh, I've been saying it for a while, is in a death spiral, probably worse than that. It's on its last legs. Uh, and finally, I think uh, the new minister of, uh, of defense there uh, finally said it under just pure pressure, uh, said, yeah, we are in a death spiral here. We're in a bad situation. Recruitment numbers have bottomed our, our personnel levels are barely to maintain operations and we keep you know uh pulling the rug out from the military in terms of resources right so the equipment's rusting can't yeah. takes forever to get new equipment and whatnot we're in this this very difficult situation and we need to ramp up very quickly uh based on the external threats that we're facing right and our allies are calling for it. Um, some of the European countries, thankfully, are starting to get the message. They're going to 2 to 3% uh, spending of GDP to get the military uh, up to snuff to face the growing Russian threat. Um, but we are in this tough situation. There is the Russian threat. There's also very important to us is the Chinese threat, the Chinese rivalry. And we need to be able to respond to that and support um, our primary ally, which is the United States. Mm -hmm. Now that said, I go to, I talk about defense spending as well, but there's also a realization, a promotion and a push for energy. Yes. So we've had a number of times to support our Western Alliance, to support our allies, isn't just about our defense spending. It's about uh, ensuring our resources get to market and our allies have access to it. So, uh, what I mean by that is we've had a number, a couple of leaders within Europe asking, asking, seeking our, our natural resources, primarily natural gas, right, which is critical for them for their energy sector and to heat their homes. And our Prime Minister, Trudeau, and his ministers have pushed against that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this Jedi mind trick. Hey, we really need your energy. We really need it. You don't need our energy right? You don't need it. <laughs> right. Go seek it somewhere else. Well, that pushes them under the thumb of regimes like Putin, right? Who has the energy, right? They need to break apart from that. Our energy, oil and gas, is one of the most ethically produced uh, energies in the world. It's one of the most cleanest. It has some of the most stringent environmental standards, workplace safety standards, best hiring practices, and it's in a country, a democratic uh, and lawful country. We should be proud of it. Yeah. But it's been <clears throat> demonized so thoroughly over the last 10 years. That needs to stop. 
We're an energy superpower. Access to cheap energy is very much tied to our quality of life. We want good health care. We want great schools. Energy is going to be a big part of that. So we need to get past that. And I think the Conservatives on the poly of government, government will be playing a big role of that. And that will be important as we go forward in uh, these difficult times ahead. Absolutely. Sorry, I went on a bit of a rant there. No, that was good. That was good. I was, yeah, no, that was, uh, there was, there was a lot of different points in there. There was a lot to unpack and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to recall even, there were so many things I wanted to bring up. <laughs> on the energy sector, um, it seems like what we do in Canada for some reason, like, so we, we, we get our own oil here and then we ship it out overseas and then we buy it back. Is that what we're doing right For now? Refinement, yeah, some For refinement. Yeah. Some of refinement. Yeah. So refinements uh, to refine our products. Uh, refinement is a much bigger capital uh, investment. Uh, to build that and it's very leery for companies to do that capital investment to build refining capacity and capability when you're constantly being told there's no future in it although demand keeps going right, up, and, up. Right. and in brunswick one of the critical things um and as uh if i'm a future uh, member of the federal government yep. i will wholeheartedly work uh and support the premier of this province. Uh, right now, you have the premier of this province trying once again to try and push to say, "Hey, we've got natural gas, big resource here. Let's tap it. Let's get it uh, and ship it to market." Right. Right now, we bring it in and and uh, from the United States primarily. Mm. So that needs to stop. That's a, a big um, a thing for an economic future for our province. We need to push that. That's a big thing for New Brunswick. It's right. a, actually, it's a big call uh, for for most of Canada. When we look to the uh, economic future for our children, is I want to play a part in this. Is I don't want my kids when they grow up to be in a situation that they have to move to Alberta or Saskatchewan right. for right. an economic future. Right, and that was the case for a lot of people within the last two decades. Yeah, and it's 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 coming back again with the energy sector growing in, in the prairie provinces, right? And that's not just a maritime thing, that's across the country, right? Like that yeah. you know, affects people in BC and all that too. Like, hey, where can I go to get a good job, pays well and all that? going to go to like something like Alberta, right? right? So we need to push for that. So we need to reduce inter, um, inter-provincial trade barriers. Uh, we need to ensure that we can get en our energy to market. And again, our resource sector not to be demonized. So when it comes to people running, um, there's normally main focus points that they have. There's main things that they want to change. What do you think are the main the main um, points that you'd want to change first coming, um, let's, uh, coming into... Um, if I get to the federal? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, what would be the main... Well, I have what to... What would be your main points? <laughs> well, I mean, I think the main points are pretty much what the conservatives are are fighting for, right? Okay. And, okay. and so... So you're right aligned with those values uh, then, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't put my name forward or be interested in putting my name forward if I didn't agree wholeheartedly with those... Uh, points, right? Yeah. Axing the tax, getting more homes built, uh, you know, slowing down immigration a bit, uh, reforming the justice system here to reduce the, this ridiculous bail system where like criminal goes in, criminal comes right back out, right? Right, needs, right, right, right. Needs, uh, needs to change it. I think the um, uh, local MP there, Rob Moore, has been really good on advocating and speaking on that issue. Right. But uh, I mean, the biggest one, you'll see it, like people's shoulders go up right away. It's just in meeting someone for a coffee and they could hear us talk. And right away, they're like, what do you need to do to get rid of the tax? If you're going to get rid of the carbon tax, <laughs> the, you have my vote. So ax like the tax. Ax the tax. Ax the tax. Uh, is, yep. is, 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 uh, advocates for well, the carbon tax will get upset that it's such a simple line, yeah. but it has gotten down to that point. It is simple. Get rid of that tax. Well, we need to put more money back into people's pockets is the problem. It yep. seems like there's there's less and less um, of people's hard-earned money being able to stay in, in their pockets. And it's being taken by taxes. It's being taken by inflation. It's being taken by um, the rise in gas and grocery prices yep. and all of these issues are visually like it's it's you can visually see it deteriorating cities and i mean we have more more homeless now than yep. than ever before we've never seen anything like that in saint john and you hear people talking about finance issues more than ever before and yep. i and i and i really feel 
for everybody. And it's and it's crazy the amount of taxes that that we do have to pay even before the carbon tax came into effect. Yep. So absolutely, I think that is a major, a well, major, well, a major yeah. point. So I mean, is. Uh, you know, socialists will always, and there's a fair bit of socialist uh, attitude. Uh, you'll, I've seen it in St. John within a lot of our municipal as, uh, and provincial advocates. Yeah, I'd love another coffee. Great coffee, by the way. Uh, <laughs> is uh, again this this demonization of of uh, capitalism, capital, money, profits. Money doesn't care what they think. Money does not care. Money will go no. yeah. where it's treated best. Right. And in Canada, when it's so highly taxed, um, it's going to go somewhere else. Yep. Right. The one benefit that we has a, have as a country is generally we are a country of uh, good, uh, you know, good governance and order. Like we 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 have a, we are a country of laws, right? Mm -hmm. So um, compared to some places uh, where a government can quickly swoop in, grab your money, change the value of your currency, and drop the hat. Generally, that doesn't happen here. Now, I know some people are going to talk <laughs> about the freezing of bank accounts. Ooh, uh, yeah, yeah, right. That was <laughs> strange. What a weird situation that was. And I and that I don't I don't want I don't want like all the hate to come towards you and all that stuff. So I won't go there. Right. Uh, but again, that's uh, that is creating that does cause people concerns, right? That of course, does it cause does. investors concerns, right? When they right. can see like government come in, start freezing accounts and all that based yeah. on a sentiment that is against their their form of government, right? right. So have to be careful. But I, I believe in a country of, of generally of good good order, good governance, law, that, that's one of the attractions, right? Um, but we have to get law it on the freedom. tax side. Law and freedom too, right? Mm -hmm. Laws and, and, and uh, having the government, I mean, yeah, that was a very strange, strange scenario. I'm gonna like you I'm, said. I'm going to test your French press here and see if... What, what kind of bean you got going on here? What, what Which coffee is it? That is, I believe it's just some Costco. It's not smooth. It's good. It, yeah, I'll, it's I'll not bad. It, you know yeah. what? The girlfriend made that. I'll let her know. Mm. There's one point I wanted to bring up. So when you were on the tangent, there was something I wanted. I had it in my mind and then it slipped. I was, I was, so many I was trying to hang now. on to it. James, the problem that I see and the thing that makes me frustrated already is I agree. I think Pierre is going to get, um, is going to be the next premier. No, Prime Minister. Prime, Prime Minister. Minister, sorry, Prime sorry, Minister. sorry, sorry, Prime Minister. <laughs> so let me restart that. James, the problem I see, because I want to make this one a good clip. James, the problem I see is coming in is um, Pierre Polivier having to come in and clean up the mess that Trudeau has created. And I think that puts him in a very difficult spot because yep. like you said, he's got to come in and I think that that's going to be used against him. He's of almost, course. even as he comes in, it's almost an uphill losing battle because there is such a disaster to clean up. Yep. And as he's going through that, it's going to be messy. And and the liberals will use that as ammo to say, look at him being inefficient, look at him being ineffective. And it scares me that he'll come in and it'll be a very short window because it can't be done quick. It's not a, it's not a yep. quick process. Yeah. What do you what do you think about that, and what do you see see transpiring? Again, he's going to have uh, him, the Conservative Party, are going to have their work towards maintaining the federation. Uh, the plan going forward, or whatever is brought forward or decided upon, uh, may not be the perfect solution for everyone, but it will be a solution we can all live with, and that is this country, that is Canada. Might not be the perfect thing, but it's something that we can all agree upon and we can all live with and go forward and believe in this country, which is, again, one of the greatest countries in the world. Yeah. Um, it is going to be hard. It's going to be hard. Like, I mean, one, we can, we can stop the ridiculous spending on consultancies within the public sector. The public sector uh, has grown, grown parable. Like, it's just ridiculous how much the public sector has expanded under the Trudeau government. Meanwhile, uh, small, medium enterprises, small businesses, uh, you know, companies, that number's like, it's now I think trending down, but like mm -hmm. public sector has grown to a ridiculous level. Yeah. You would think under that growth, you wouldn't need 
to spend all this money on consultancies, but they have. And it's already come up and bit them in the butt in terms of the ad scam uh, issue, right? Where a member of the public sector, um, getting a good public sector wage, all whatnot, uh, bids and wins a contract as a third party consultant. And what for an app that should have cost, I think $60,000, goes into, I think, into the tens of millions costing Canadian taxpayers, right? Right. Total farce, total grift. And, right, if the incentives are there, that type of stuff is going to occur. That needs to stop. And, again, there will probably be some resistance to it, but uh, Pierre Polyev has got the shoulders for it. He does. And that's why I'm willing to to fight with him uh, and fight to be a part of that party, right? What was his local clip? It was the WTF? Where's the (laughs) The funds? funds? Where's the funds? WTF. And they said, that's not parliamentary language. No. (laughs) That's not parliamentary. He said, where's the funds? Yeah, yeah. That was good. That was good. And he's good like that. He's witty. That's another thing that I do like about him is that he's, he's, he's not only intelligent but he's witty which it it brings more people along for the ride right and yep. it and it gets more people behind him and and acts the tax like you said it is just a little bit of a slogan but it's true yep. and it's and that's almost the way that you need to make politics you almost have to break it down into the simplest language for everybody because it can be so complex and they can be up there talking about all this thing yeah. all these things that just go over most people's heads and yep. Everybody needs to be involved and at least know. So that's one thing that I do appreciate about him is that he breaks it down into probably the simplest language and and almost makes politics for everybody, which in when you're intelligent, that's a very difficult thing to or when you're intelligent, it's easy, but it's hard to do. Right. So that's a hard thing to do is is to make. Um, and to and to create like the the language that everybody can get behind. I, I also think that uh, some of the people part of the Conservative Party and the people that are being attracted and joining the ranks are quite impressive. So I think there will be some very impressive uh, ministers yep. uh, in the future. Uh, yeah, and very well spoken individuals. Um, so I, yeah, I look. I'm looking forward to it. It needs to change. I. I'm fearful and you've put this point forward of like what <laughs> I kind of like the, the kingdom of ash here uh, of ashes, like Trudeau is kind of going on a scorched earth policy right now. You have like, you just <laughs> yeah. spend, spend, drop money, even our local MP. Uh, he continues to point his claim to fame is how much money he can just milk the government for and drop on his writing, which I mean, you know, there's an element that is good to that in terms of like, yeah, you get like a nice park here, this and that, some community amenities. At the same time, when you're running such massive deficits, huge debt, when I think we're projected now to be on the hook to have to make over forty five and a half billion uh, dollar payments towards interest alone on the debt. Yeah. So t- over 10% of government <laughs> revenue oh, wow. uh, yeah. going to debt. That's more money the, going to debt servicing than it is to the military. You know, maybe like the local, maybe uh, Mr. Long should be a little bit smarter on what he says. And I've seen people getting frustrated saying like, okay, yeah, like enough, like, like even the bank of Canada is starting to make signals of like, Hey, like slow down the spending. We cannot drop rates. If you keep like, uh, contributing to inflation by your overspending, right? right. And continuing to drive Canada further and further in debt. Right. Like it needs to stop. We need, and of course they'll, They'll push back to like, well, okay, so you're going into austerity measures. What are you going to cut? Like, you're going to cut everything? Like, oh, you're going to rip the guts out of health care and this? and it's, right. Like, let's first, again, I'll say let's first get our financial house in order. Yes, let's stop yep. with all the money and the funds going to these third-party consultants. Let's build some better efficiencies and practices within the public sector. You know, like there is, you know, and enough of the boutique projects make the regulations a lot more clear uh, and supportive uh, of industries to go in and, and like, again, invest in Canada, invest in our energy sector, invest in our resources. Right now, it's it's so convoluted and questionable. Uh, a lot of these companies just, they can't afford um, to do the capital investments uh, that are required and take the risk on when things, when it's an 
a high risk, convoluted uh, investment envi- environment. It needs mm. to change. So it like, you know, fight to get that in order. And, and again, like I, I, it just I haven't seen it a lot from uh, local liberal MPs here. Your 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 claim to fame can't be pork barreling, right. which is just drop money willy nilly onto your riding and hoping that you're basically buying votes with people's tax dollars, right? right? Like it's, oh, it's like people will say, oh, this is great, it's free money. It's not free money. No, that everybody is your pays tax, for it that, in taxes. That's your tax dollars yep. going into it. And your tax dollars are continuing to pay more and more into growing the debt, which then is making government seek more and more fancy ways of to increasing their tax revenue inflation. and milking you more yeah. of your paycheck. Inflation and carbon taxes. Yep. And, and, it, uh, and that's... It seems like the government has no real responsibility to run things like a business. There's they they get to just print money. They get to tax. It's like everybody else pays the repercussions of their decisions, right? Yeah. So the, and that's where things get frustrating when you have all this liberal spending on just like you said unnecessary things like these apps <laughs> like like consultations for for apps that don't even i don't think that got designed did it uh, i think it did and i think it did it, it was a did, big flaw and it was poorly it was designed right. poorly and it was right. it basically uh died in a whimper because it was such a poorly designed application. and i mean there's people with much less funds running better apps out of their basement sure sure <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so it's just like, it's just unnecessary unnecessary spending and so yeah james this is there's a lot of issues here we, we man dropped. there's a lot of issues <laughs> there's a lot of things to talk about here this has been so intense this I has mean, been the, so intense the one thing like and i'll, I'll do like the the little selling clip here yeah. is i think people will see that i'm pretty passionate on very this passionate stuff. Uh, I have some form of brain here and I can speak somewhat eloquently, I, I hope, on the issues. Um, but I can't do it without your support. Yeah. And so people are wondering, like, how can I support James? Well, the so first step is the nomination uh, race or nomination battle. So head to my website, www.jamesrobertson.ca. And I'll link it in the description. Sweet. Sign up, go to my Facebook, like my Facebook page or follow my Facebook page because I'll be pumping videos there. Same with Instagram. I'm pretty active on Twitter. So all the links are there within the um, page. Key to a nomination, uh, generally I think for every any party or m- most, um, is you need to be a member of that party. And so you go to the, if you subscribe through my webpage, which I ask you to do, go subscribe. It will ask you if, if you're a member or not. If you're not a member, you hit the link and it go goes, and it's like for $15 for a year, right. sign up at the nominate or sign up, become a member of the conservative party. And then you have a voice when the nomination race is called to come put a check behind uh, my name and help me become the uh, conservative representative uh, for this riding. Right. And I think it's more important now than ever before that more people get out and actually become active in sure, yeah. in voting, in making a decision for where the country is headed, because there's so many people who just were disconnected. Like you said, boring politics are good politics. So for the longest time, nobody really checked in yeah. until the last, I'd say, four years, everybody started to go, who's in charge? What's who's going charge? on? Yeah. Who's Which making the policies? Yeah. Which yeah. level of government? And, I, I, and I, mean, I mean, politics almost became like celebrityism in a way where everybody yeah. now started tu- <laughs> tuning in saying, okay, what's what's Blaine Higgs saying? What's everybody, what's Trudeau saying? And I mean, even tuning into the, to the US government and like yeah. all of this stuff became almost sensationalized, but it's because it's been so important over the last few years. And um, so now more than ever before, I think it is important that people do get out and vote for what they want because like you said we all do get a say and it's important for us to to um to make that vote and be part of the direction that this country is headed yeah. and i'm approachable and reachable you can reach me through my website it has my email link there uh if you want to set up for a phone call i've done that with a number of people you just set up you know or you message me through facebook uh i'll give you a call maybe give me a day or two because i do have a full-time job i you know uh, right. Wife works. Kids. We have kids. Life's busy. So please, and- <laughs> yeah, please, please don't take it as like I'm unattentive and all that. It's just this isn't 
this isn't my full-time job. This is right. like something like right Yet. now on the side of many other things, but mm. I am pushing it hard. I am working hard and I will get back to you, uh, hopefully within 24 to 48 hours. But yeah, that's, that's where it's at. You know, right you want to get, you want to get involved. You want to have a say, this is where it starts. And sometimes as unsexy as politics might seem, or, or we just want to all talk about, you know, grandiose policy ideas, it still comes down to like signing up, reaching out to your local uh, uh, government representative, getting involved, knocking on doors. And with that, I can always use help. Absolutely. Thank you very much, James. Appreciate it. Thanks.